Welcome to Meadowlarkers 24, The Surrender. It's been a while, but Kate Fagan and Amin El Hassan are still here, as am I. I'm Howard Bryant, and here we go. After a lockout that pushed opening day back a week and relations between owners and players back into the mean old days, baseball has returned. On the field, it won't be the same game it once was. For the first time, the designated hitter will exist full-time in the National League. The ill-fated seven-inning doubleheader is now mercifully dead. Another ill-fated idea, the Ghost Runner on second base in extra innings, is also dead. The Ghost Runner is dead. Long live the Ghost Runner. But you know what lives? Illegal defense. In baseball. The rule would de- I'm sorry, one, two, three. The rule will debut next year, but the dreaded and controversial shift will soon be banned. No more will Little League coaches around the country excoriate multi-million dollar players for not simply hitting the ball the other way, or laying down a bunt, or just tapping a fastball into the vast wasteland of unoccupied space. The game, it's surrendered to the analytics that say players can't or won't simply hit the ball the other way. The numbers have said taking a second baseman and playing him in short field like it's softball is the proper way to take hits away from David Ortiz and Freddie Freeman. And, in surrender, the players didn't adjust. But why? Personally, I never believed in banning shifts, for there is an antidote, but the surrender of resorting to a rule change isn't exactly given in to the stubbornness of the players as much as it is recognizing the analytics have beaten strategy, and baseball decided the smart people had taken the game out of balance and they needed to be stopped. The same conversation is taking place in basketball. The analytics guys have determined that the highest percentage shots in the game are the dunk and the corner three. And what are the conversations in the game now? Not to better defend the corner, but to expand the court for the purpose of making the corner three a harder shot. There's even talk of expanding to implement four-point shots on different parts of the court. Perhaps this isn't anything new. Rules are implemented all the time as a reaction to sports figuring out what strategies they can get away with that hurt the game. Remember the hack-a-shack? But banning the shift in baseball baseball is the... the... Hello? What happened there? Chris, you still there? Yeah, sorry. I don't know what happened there. Um, I could just hear myself in an echo. Let's try this again. One, two, three. Perhaps this isn't anything new. Rules are implemented all the time as a reaction to sports figuring out what strategies they can and can't get away with that hurt the game. Remember the hack-a-shack? But banning the shift in baseball is the clearest sign that the influence of the numbers people is unbalancing the game. Soon, because of the prevalence of openers, The criteria for a starting pitcher to receive a win may be next to go. Does another surrender loom, or will pitchers just go back to the old-fashioned way and pitch five innings, like it used to be? We are back. It's it's been a while. It's been a couple of weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Good to see everybody. And I was uh, I was thinking about this when we were talking about this this topic. It sort of reminds me a little bit of standardized testing. Are are we teaching to the test, or is Mm -hmm. Is the I'm sorry, are, are we learning from the test or are we teaching to the test? And maybe at some level it sort of it, it, it all rolls in into the same thing. But I sort of feel like the analytics part of this is different, especially in baseball, when you have an illegal defense. You just don't add rules to baseball. It's a, the, the whole question is, is is figure it out. And this new rule change sort of suggests that baseball is saying we can't figure it out or we don't want to figure it out. I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on where this is going? Yeah. It, it, first of all, it's just so delightfully weird to me that this is something that's collectively bargained in baseball, a rule on the field of how the game is played, not how the money is divvied up is determined in the collective bargaining room, uh, which is very different of course, from basketball where rules changes happen from the league. There's a competition committee that suggests and then the board of governors, which is basically the owners, have to vote yay or nay on it. So the players have no say in basketball about rule changes? No, not really. Not really. I, I, the competition committee often features former players, but uh, as far as a players association a representative in that, no. The rules of the game are, are for the league to dictate. So 
And, and I, by the way, uh, you know, maybe uh, this is my basketball bias. I think that's how it should be. I tell you how the game is played, and then w- then we can have a conversation, negotiation on how we split this money. That's you know, or you know, or how uh, how deals are done. You know, the rules and regulations regarding you really those. Are management. <laughs> oh, oh, all the way, <laughs> all the way. Why do, why do I need to ask the players how they want to play? That's <laughs> it's just so Great. bizarre. But um, you know, the the idea here is. And I know you made a comp in your in your intro there with basketball and the three point line kind of changing the dynamics of how the game is played. But I'm of a believe I'm a big believer in that. There, if we're talking about strategy shifting, not as a result of a new rule, but of something that's existed for decades, but people are finally figuring out how to exploit <laughs> that that rule. I always feel it's cyclical, meaning. You see it in the NBA where there's such an emphasis on denying three-pointers, particularly those corner three-pointers. What's happening is it gives rise to the greater value of the player who is a good three-point shooter, but when closed out to, I can then go attack the soft spots of the defense, which are the mid-range jumpers. I can get to those spots, get a clean look, and make it at a high enough clip. The reason why a lot of basketball players don't shoot that mid-range shot and beyond them being discouraged, is that many of them aren't good at it. In terms of dribble, pull up, 18 feet, 20 feet, a lot of them aren't good at it. And so they're encouraged either to get to the front of the rim or or give up and pass the ball to somebody else and then repeat the cycle. In baseball, I get the feeling that it's not because no one's good at hitting into those spots. It's that you just, you can never do it enough to counteract the defense of the shift. Am I, do I have that right? Well, the argument, the argument is that three things are happening that they did not believe were happening before. One is that the increased velocity, the guys are just throwing too hard now. Guys are throwing 100 miles an hour, that the speed of the game has just increased. You know, pitchers are six foot eight now and they're just throwing gas straight <laughs> down. So it's not as easy to go bunt to the other side. It's not as easy to hit the other way. It's, 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 easier, it's easier said than done. That's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is culture, that the game itself, you know, whether you go to Ted Williams in the 1940s when Lou Boudreau was shifting on him back when he was managing the Cleveland Indians before, you know, World War II, um, to now, you don't pay me if I'm David Ortiz or Freddie Freeman to bunt. You right. pay to watch me hit the ball out of the ballpark or to hit bullets <clears throat> to the other side. So culture, do you really want to see this? And then the third thing, of course, is the increased pressure on the sport to become more exciting. And mm. this is not exciting. Hitting a two hopper to the second baseman who's standing in the middle of the grass is not exciting. And baseball, more than any other sport, is constantly being attacked for not being interesting. And so they just felt these three things together, that the players aren't going to do it, the pitchers are throwing harder, and the game is feeling more and more pressure to be more interesting and to you know, pace of play, uh, that that... That, that those three things together, like, you know what? We're not going to wait for the next cycle where guys are hunting. We're right. going to make a rule right now. Kate. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that to me is the part that I find fascinating about this move by baseball is the lack of patience in a game that is Doesn't historically known. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> the whole Most point of the game is patience. Is patience, is yeah. patience and evolution and see how the game see how it unfolds and then we'll strategic here and there. And I think they're in a, whether it's an inability or a lack of desire to be patient for what Amin is talking about, like the, the counter evolution of the player to, to combat the way the game is being played. I don't know that they can wait whatever the cycle is. Right. I, Cause I don't think it's one of those things where, Oh, okay. The shift is now huge. Like, just give me a year, give me a year in the batting cage. And I got this thing handled. Mm -hmm. You're you're really talking about waiting for five to seven years until kids who are, you know, playing right now are coming up and getting drafted out of high school. So, so maybe there isn't, maybe the, the ability to be patient on this doesn't exist, but it is, but it is confusing. And it brings up the question of like, whether we want our sports to be like unrestrained evolution or we want it to be controlled evolution. And this is definitely controlled evolution because unrestrained evolution would just be, we've got all these numbers. We now know where we can put guys for each batter. 
And we are going to wait until the batters come up with a way to balance this. But that's not, sorry, I mean, hop in here. No, I mean, it's, it, this is really interesting to me because I always think about what is, we talk about, we want the excitement, the excitement of the home run and the dingers and all that. And I say, well, what is excitement, right? What makes exciting things exciting? And I thought about the NBA All-Star game, right? So if I ask you, what's an exciting basketball play? So yeah, either a guy dunking on somebody or dunking or uh, a guy hitting like a really crazy three-pointer, right? Like that's exciting. What if we made it all dunks and threes? You'd be like, yeah, that's that would be exciting. But then you watch the NBA All-Star game, you realize it's not that exciting. And why is that? It's, it's that the, what was exciting about it was that you had to overcome odds to do it. Yeah. When it's commonplace, it loses its excitement. Chocolate cake as a dessert is delightful as a once in a while kind of treat. But if I hate chocolate, if I eat chocolate cake every single day, morning, noon, and night, it ceases to be exciting at some point. It's not a treat anymore. It just is what it is. And and so I think about all of this when you ask about restrained evolution or just let it go the way it, the way it goes i think oftentimes the result of it is this might seem counter counterintuitive but it is the result of you trying to control it you try to say yeah. you know it would be better if we had more of this yeah yeah let's yeah. make it so this is more uh valuable and thus more uh virtuous to go after and then when people start doing that what ends up happening is everyone's just pushing that button. They want to keep feeling that feeling, but the more you hit that button, the less the feeling comes down because you realize all you have to do is hit a button for it. You don't have to actually work to get it. Well, the name of this of this episode is called The Surrender. And when you're watching baseball, the surrender is you can see it to analytics on virtually every batter. When he was managing the Phillies, and now managing the Giants, Gabe Kapler was shifting per batter. He was moving, he was changing positions. So like if you're trying to keep score, the left fielder is only the left fielder on this batter, but not on that batter. Like they, he was actually changing who was playing which position based on who was hitting. And so the numbers, and you're starting to look at the, the amount of data, it is changing exactly how even the things that we think are basic. And so it feels like what the sport is doing is saying enough. And to Kate's point, it's not a five to seven year evolution. They've been shifting for almost 20 years now. So now you're looking yeah. at another five to seven years on top of that. So you're looking at two generations worth of what this sport is. And to me, baseball just had enough. They're like, okay, that this is what it's going to be. We've got analytics now. We've got the money ball generation. They've been shifting since the 03, 04 season on a daily basis. And enough's enough that we can't, we are going to surrender to the way, to the analytics, to the way that this sport is being played. Yeah. Well, because the anal to use analytics to talk about analytics in, in, you know, researching some of this topic when it comes to the baseball side, I was trying to understand how prevalent is this? How, how, what percentage are we talking about guys getting hits that should be hits? from should be from like a traditional baseball idea of like you line drive up the middle that should usually be a hit and it you know by looking at the data you're talking about 575 outs that are now outs that would have previously been hits before with the tradition shift. with a traditional defense traditional setup defense yeah. placement yeah and that's and you know and then breaking down the math further that's like 1.5 percent of of hits so like not a lot, but but as a sports fan, like a lot, like a, a, a good amount, yeah. a pretty significant amount that if you're saying with this one move, we're going to inject 2% life back in, like those, all of those things are now going to be hits, like, and you can just do it right off the bat. You know, you've got 2% more. Bat? And what does that do to the next batter? Because right. now you get a guy on first, now you get a guy on second. And so all of a sudden, maybe yeah. you have more excitement, you have more rallies instead of having, you know, two hop two hop outs to a guy yeah. playing a short field like it's like it's slow pitch softball <laughs> but I, I also i also wonder because w one question that kept coming up for me in this in this conversation is what is the line between knowledge and analytics and understanding that you're applying and then something that starts to feel like a form of self-sabotage for the game because 
you know, you, you look at any basketball player, right? Like in college, we had our scouting reports and I knew their play calls, right? If they mm-hmm. were a team that had certain play calls and I knew their hand gestures, I also knew everybody I was guarding and tried to implement some sense of strategy as you're guarding them. Where, when does it shift and cross a line to almost sabotaging the sport? Because like, here, here's an analogy is like, it's okay for me to sit down at a blackjack table. And if I'm smart enough, which I'm not, Mm-hmm. pay attention to the shoe and the cards that are coming out and get a sense. If I could count them in my head, it's not a problem. If I can apply some amount of analytics to sitting down to that table, nobody has a problem. Now, if I have teamwork, <laughs> now we have a problem. If I, right. So like in baseball, it's like, if, if you as a third baseman can just like be leaning left, cause you know, the guy always hits a certain way or leaning, right. Cool. But the second it starts to pour in from the outside and become like a whole department. Is that like, where do we even like, where do we draw the line on this? Well, and that's where you see in the game, for example, they teams have analytics departments now have 14, 15, 20 people like the Texas Rangers and the Houston Astros. I think their analytics departments are over 20 now. And Mm -hmm. on top of that, like when you watch baseball, like when you watch guys in the outfield now, which is like, they all look like NFL quarterbacks. They've actually got plays in their hats. They've got plays on their wrists. I'm like, what are you? What is it, third long? <laughs> what are you yeah. doing? You're playing center field. What are you doing <laughs> with code on your wrist? It's supposed to be, you know, your sweatbands and your and your sunflower seeds. Yeah. And You're so supposed it, to react to the ball coming off the that, bat. That's what that, I thought. That's what it's supposed to be, right? And so, but now it is, the, the question to me when I think about this is how much are we looking towards something as new that has essentially already been there and and how much of this is baseball specific because baseball is the chicken little sport in terms of every single thing that happens in the game it's like the game is over i mean if you go back and look at if you go back and look at newspapers from the 50s they talked about baseball being too slow and the average time a game was like 140. now the average time (laughs) a game is like over three it's like 320 and so or 308 now or whatever and so it, how much of this is also very specific to baseball where other sports are so much easier in terms of like adapting and evolving. But baseball, when we look at things because of that stone tablet attitude that the game has had since the end of the Civil War, that nothing can change in this game, even though, you know, it used to be eight balls to a walk as that's, well. Back that's, in the day. that's the crazy thing is that baseball has had these seismic changes in their rules they haven't had them since 1899 uh, but that's i guess my, my thing is what cha- or even like the idea of relief pitchers weren't a thing right yeah you know or, the late 80s right or uh, uh, uh what's it called uh obviously the dh we know uh is now going to well, be coming that's right and what did baseball do i mean baseball finally a couple years ago said well yeah this whole tony la Russa thing where one one pitcher comes in to face one guy. Now you now you got to pitch to a minimum of three batters. Hmm. The the uh, uh, what was the other thing I was just gonna say? Another one of these weird. Uh, oh, interleague play. Yeah. I, I mean, so so things that were that they held near and dear to themselves. Uh, branding on on uniforms. I, I yeah. See the the the, the, the umpires have FTX on them, right? So crypto baby. <laughs> you know, so it's 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 weird to me that you know you say oh, I, it's like saying oh I I never ever 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 drink when I go out, it, or I never or I never smoke. Well, I only smoke when I drink. I only drink when I'm with friends. Well, I'm only with friends like uh, you know three to four days a week. Well, like, it sounds like you're a smoker. <laughs> you're doing all this stuff, but like to to continue to cling to this ideal that by the way no one's asking you to cling to, because as you pointed out. Football and basketball, they, they change rules all the time. So I, I, I'm kind of, I wonder and I, I ponder if this is a generational thing, meaning as baseball teams get inherited or bought by younger and younger owners of a younger generation, will we see more of these wholesale type changes to do what's best for the game rather than just say, well, this is how we've always done it. Yeah, I think what you're seeing in the sport right now is an amalgam of this attitude that the sport is in danger. Every single year, we hear the same thing. Is baseball dead? Baseball's mm-hmm. in crisis. And every after every World Series, they talk about the ratings being down, even though this, the, the way people view 
television is different is more different now than ever before. And then every single time at the end of the World Series, they go back and they talk about how the average age for a baseball fan is now in the mid 60s. Mm -hmm. Right. So so they are reacting to the demogra to what they think the demographic shifts are and they are trying to bring this sport into what they consider to be the modern age. And this was happening, Kate, about five years ago, maybe a little longer, but I think around five years ago, all of a sudden, the big buzzword in baseball was attention span, was everybody swiping their screens. And ever since attention span became part of the lexicon in baseball, but leading up to this collective bargaining agreement, everything has been based on speeding up the game. Now we got a pitch clock. Now you can't change pitchers unless you go through three guys. Now you've now we're getting rid of shifts because people, you know, you're gonna keep their attention span. And the players have been like, the game is fine. Right. People are right. watch the people who want to watch baseball watch baseball. The people who come to the to a baseball stadium to watch a baseball game are expecting baseball. What is the problem here? Yeah, and that's and that is the the question I'm I've been asking myself about baseball for the last couple of years is, is it serving itself well to have this mentality about the game? Because, you know, a comp that I often think of is like I was talking to. Simone Augustus, she's an Olympian, played in the W for a lot of years, a few weeks ago about how in the first iter the first 15 to 20 years of the W, they very much, the players were coming from this perspective of if we make one wrong step, the threat of it going away mm -hmm. is, is looming large. Therefore, we're behaving differently than we, than we would have. And we're chasing, and the W is always chasing some audience that never existed for them to begin with. Like, maybe baseball's fans aren't going to get older and older and die. Maybe they'll just always be older. And as you get older, you appreciate baseball more. And, and coming from a perspective. And so anyways, to, to round out the Simone story and, and W, it's like once they just wrap their mind around, oh, what actually helps us grow and connect with people is like being the game that we are and the people that we are and the people that come around to that come around to that. Maybe that's a very like anti-capitalistic view of where baseball needs to be. Let me ask this question because baseball games are longer now or reached the point, Howard, to your point five years ago where they were longer than they'd ever been. What was uh, the, uh, thus necessitating this thing for a pitch clock and you know all the stuff to speed it up? Why did it get to that point? And is it wrong for them to want to address, hey, our games are too long? Because even for the traditional baseball fan, it never used to take this long. Yeah. Well, when Jackie Robinson retired, so we're going to the mid-60s now. He'd been retired for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Gave an interview and pretty much talked about it. And this fact, this happened a few years after he retired, even earlier before he was in the Hall of Fame. I don't watch baseball. It's too boring. It's Jackie Thanks. Robinson talking about I don't watch Thanks. baseball. It's too boring, right? <laughs> And and so this is once again, this is the culture of the sport. They've been saying this for decades, every mm. decade. Somebody talks about baseball needing to be sped up. The reason why baseball had gotten so long now. Now, if you talk to Tony, I'm, telling, I'm sorry, if you talk to Sandy Alderson, he'll tell you that one of the big reasons, one of his big problems in the sport was walk up music. That if you start <laughs> looking at all of the different things that just add seconds and seconds and seconds. Now we got to wait 30 seconds for Derek Jeter to listen to his song before he steps in the box and he's mm. waiting. And so you multiply that by 20, by, you know, 27 batters minimum. Right. And so then there's that. And then, then there's the pitchers who now take forever to throw the ball. Like there was somebody, somebody ran a, a, a clip last week or so on social media about a pitcher throwing however many, uh, somebody in their delivery. And then they, they, you know, spliced it over to Dennis Eckersley in the 80s and he had thrown in that same time he'd thrown like three pitches oh wow you no know, guys are just taking longer they're just right. taking longer and so then there's that and then of course let's not forget the money now they're adding 40 45 seconds extra to each you know to each commercial break right because now there's money at stake so especially in the postseason they're adding another minute of of, of ad time so before you know it without even talking about the actual pace of play your game is 22 minutes longer your game is 25 minutes longer, whatever. And so all of these different things are forcing pressure on the game itself. There have always been guys in baseball 
who took forever. The, you know, Carlton Fisk used to take forever. Mike Hargrove, his nickname was the, you know, the human rain delay. They used to call uh, Mike Moore, the pitcher for the A's. His games lasted forever. It took him forever. We would sit in the press box and somebody would just yell, throw the ball, right? He'd just sit there and wait to throw the ball. And all of these things are different because it's not a timed sport. And this is also the pressure of television. The same thing is happening in tennis. You know, Rafa Nadal's matches take longer because he takes 35 seconds in between serving the ball. So what does tennis have now? He's got to wipe his hair away. He's got to do the hair. He's got to do the wedge. He's got to do the, he's he's, he's got to do the eyebrows. He's got to do the the sideburns and everything else. (laughs) And so what do they have in tennis now? They've got a serve clock because television is saying, hey, speed this up. So at the end of the day, even though we're talking strategy and we're talking analytics at the end of the day, we're still talking money. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is, it's making me think of like even the Oscars, like whatever artificial, whatever artificial shot clock, right? Speech clock you put in, not that it doesn't work. I mean, what are they, what are they saving? They're saving like, I don't know, what does the Oscars save? I mean, you might know better because I think you do a podcast about movies. You oh, know, they might be called? saving like, <laughs> what is that podcast? Cinephobe. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but what are, what are they going to save at the end of the day? 13 minutes? You know, seven minutes? And the Oscars, what? like, basically, that's a great, that's a great point, um, Kate. Good comp, and I'm sorry to cut you off there. No. It, it is the Oscars. I wonder, that's the next thing. We get the, our analytics team, our crack analytics team, to get them to talk about the speed, the length of the Oscars getting longer. Does it coincide with baseball getting longer and longer? Yeah, yeah. The Oscars yeah. started to take forever as well, right? And that was the big deal. Yeah. Yeah. But nothing the- you put in, nothing you put into the Oscars does any, like, it actually seems to have the counter effect. Makes it last when longer. It, yeah. And, and it seems rude. And then, you know, the music starts playing and it's, and it's not natural. Just, and again, maybe this is part of like what we're talking about, stone tablets, but like certain things in baseball, this is counter because the shift doesn't feel natural to me. Like, like I see that and that doesn't seem natural. And yet it is evolved somewhat naturally. I'm kind of all over there, both on the Oscars and like what we're doing in the shift. But I mean, you were going to jump in. <laughs> no, I I was just saying, that, first of all, it, it is funny that despite you, you're the best efforts of mice and men it does the opposite effect, right? Like the Oscars are longer and longer. It never fits within the window that it says it's going to fit in within the guide. And that's with playing people off the stage. Right. And so same thing with baseball. It's like we're doing all this stuff and yet the games aren't getting quicker. Uh, I and and. You know, I I think about, you know, as Howard detailed all of the different reasons why. If you try to take any of them away, I think people will go nuts, right? Yeah, like, this, mm-hmm. well, like let's also, also not forget they tried to speed up the intentional walk. So now, remember, you used to have to throw four balls right. for a walk. Now they just give you the four and yeah. an automatic intentional walk. I mean, well, I mean, and which is kind of true. It's like you know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Why are we going to go through the Why pantomime? Do I have to throw these four balls. Yeah, the guy like the the catcher being, and then he gets up and he walks out to the side. It's it's ridiculous. Like we get it. I just want to walk him. It's like the intentional foul in basketball. It's like. I don't have to like wait for him to make a basketball move and then try to go for the ball, but then accidentally use too much force. I just tap him on his back with two hands and, and I look at the ref like I'm fouling him. Yeah. <laughs> just blow the whistle. Let's let's go. So let's go back to basketball, I mean, for a second, because you disagreed with the thought that there's a three comp here. And I wanted to bring this up simply because when we're talking about analytics, usually when we talk about analytics and we're talking about the changes of sport, the defense has to adjust or the offense mm-hmm. has to adjust. But they are talking about widening the court. And there is a conversation about reacting to how the game is being played. So you don't see that as a, as a similar, or is it simply, I mean, now Kate and I talked about this offline the other day. It used to be, okay, we need to widen the court because the players are so damn big in the middle. Mm-hmm. Now they're talking about widening the court because there's not enough room in the corners to expand the three point line or to make that shot a little bit uh, less desirable. Right. So the size of the players and and you know i would say the dimensions of the court are too small for the modern player these are the same dimensions we use like since the peach basket i believe right 94 the, by 50 if you're 94 by 50 and then the basket being 10 feet high right like that's that's because dr naismith just nailed it there and it happened to be 10 feet high like there's no math behind that about what humans can and cannot achieve with a basket at different heights but the, the truth of the matter is the, the idea that the three-point line, that this shot is worth three 
points right here, 23 feet, 9 inches. Here, 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 here. Except for here, it's 22 feet. Why? Well, because the basketball court ain't wide enough for us to have like a 23-9 all the way around. So that doesn't make sense. We're arbitrarily saying that this shot right here is going to count the same as one that is objectively harder because it is further away from the basket. So the idea that if we change that and make it a uniform three-point line, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's that's necessary because, again, it's part of the exploitation. People didn't realize the value of the three-point shot, and when they did, they say, okay, so if it's better for me to get or if it's more efficient for me to make this shot than it is to take one from 20 feet or 21 feet, then why would I choose the more difficult version of that? Why wouldn't I just go to the corners where they are the closest? So that's why you see every offense is kind of designed at making the defense collapse because the three-point line runs hand-in-hand in, hand in concert with we can't touch people anymore in basketball. If and, and protecting the basket. I mean, when you if, if you you well, penetrate from the top, somebody right. has to come over and help, and then that leaves the corner open. Well, but, but exactly, but the idea is that why are we? Why is someone? Why does someone have to come over and help? And that's because we've taken it to a place where it's so hard for defenders to keep their man in front of them, whether it is someone uh, dribble penetration, whether it's someone in the mid post catching and facing. They can't touch. The moment a basketball player goes from back to the basket to pivot and face the basket, if my hand's on him, I've got to take my hand off. And that's not what it was in the 90s or before. And even when they changed the rule in 1995, I believe, they didn't really call it. And then 2004, they were like, okay, now we're taking it seriously. We're going to call this every single time. So it changes. It makes the offense have this massive advantage. So as a result, I can't guard a person one on one anymore. Not if and they're you can good. Carry the ball. Yeah. You can All of those directions. Yep. So it makes it harder for one on one coverage. So what does that mean? I got to send some help over. But once you send help over, now what are we doing? We're playing five on four, pretty much, or four on three on the back end because two guys are guarding one guy. So every offense is designed to force that situation where they say we can't guard you one on one. Got to send help. And then help makes everybody else be in help position. And so we're basically doing this long shell game to get to the point where that guy in the corner all the way on the other side is wide open. That shouldn't be the case, right? I wonder what it would look like if it were uniform. But the, the, for me, the fundamental difference is not that, oh, uh, everyone wants to shoot threes. Fundamental difference is, is that you you have a situation where defenses are forced to do something and give something up. So what is that something that they give up? Whether it's a weak side three-pointer or maybe it's a mid-range jumper. If you had someone who was actually pretty good at it. And that's why I always feel like it's all cyclical. It's like when they said, take the center off the, the all-star ballot. We don't have centers anymore. And guess what happened? We got this crop of very, very talented centers who are in the league. Well, how did that happen? I said, it's not that the center position doesn't matter anymore. It's we're going through a drought where there aren't, aren't any good centers. But the idea that they're gone forever was kind of ridiculous. And now we're, we're sitting here and we have Jokic and we have Embiid and we have Towns. And these guys are pure 100% centers. They're not seven-footers who are skinny. Towns and is a 100% center? Towns, Towns play, has played 100% of his minutes at center. You he's name me one lineup. Center. What's up? But he's not 100% center. He's a forward. No, he's a, in our he, in our in our definite in our nineties definition of what a center is. Well, is, is, is it because he isn't posted up on the left block and and that uh, is right, Amin. operating that around is the right. basket? That's right. He's Sam Perkins. He's out in the corner. No. He's, out, he's out. He's way out there. He's, he's out way out there, there, but he he also does stuff down there too. Yes, he does. Right, and and most importantly, the other forward or the other big that he plays with is not uh like a a six eight bruiser. He, he's playing with other guys who are doing the same thing. So basically, if I had to choose one guy out of all, all five of the guys on the Timberwolves uh, on the court, it's like, which one's the center? Yeah, it's that guy. It's Carl Towns. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it, the, the parallel there for me is that the incentive, I mean, in all of that, yes. the key thing there was that every single team is in, to some degree is incentivized to end up with a corner three. Yes. And well, the, cor the corner three is the consequence it's, not the the goal that that's the, is the goal isn't it it's it's, a, it's the consequence 
the 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 corner three is what I use to make teams have to guard my guy honestly one on one. And if you but you want to cheat, is also the goal because that's the easier shot if you're going to take the three. That's the one shot that is. If you're going right. to take well, a three, you, yeah, like oh, okay. If I go to the rim, I go to the rim. If you're gonna if you're gonna help off, I'm gonna get a corner three. So right. obviously, getting to the rim is also very high percentage play. But you're the, saying that is the consequence of helping right. on a dribble like, penetration. If if you think of almost every team in the league. It's it's this. It's like, how are we going to score slash win this game? I'm going to give it to my best player, and he's going to make something amazing happen. Yeah, but what if they use two guys to guard him? That's why we shoot corner threes. <laughs> yeah. But so so in all of this, like the parallels between baseball and basketball as we're talking about is right now we have an NBA where to some degree teams are incentivized to end up with a corner three. And in baseball, even though it doesn't always happen, guys are incentivized to like lay down a bunt or mm-hmm. hit it the opposite way. Like, and that may be the, the result of this in this flooding of analytics and knowledge that we see across, even outside of sports. And it makes the most, like, I can't argue that it's evolving naturally and we've learned data and we have numbers. And like, this is the place we've ended up at is if you want to counter the knowledge we have, you got to lay down this bunt along the third baseline here. You got to end up with a bunch of corner threes, but that doesn't mean that that is a good game to watch. Right. Well, I actually agree with that, Kate, in in, in two different ways. And I'm not even sure that the two are, are parallel. Number one, if you're incentivized to take a corner three, you get an extra point. And so there is an actual incentive to take mm-hmm. that shot, right? Yeah. In baseball, to have your 45 home run power hitter lay down a bunt, okay, you get the, you're get you incentivized for that because that is the least amount of damage that this guy is going to have on the opposition. But you don't get an extra point. You get on base, but you may actually get less value from him because now he's not a threat to hit the ball, to hit the ball out of the ballpark. So it's actually more of a defensive measure, but th- and that makes sense. The argument that baseball is making is that that is unwatchable. Even if the guy yes. started doing that, that that is unwatchable, we need to do something to make this game more watchable. To me, to your point, I find basketball completely unwatchable in a lot of ways because of the number of possessions that are given away because guys are taking really, really high, per- I mean, low percentage long shots that the entire E field goal argument of 40% from three is the same as 60% from two doesn't equate for the huge number of missed shots, 20% right. more missed shots. And I find this to be completely unwatchable when I see teams coming down court in a close game and just give possessions away because that's what the offense is asking for and that's what the defense is giving you. And so, but basketball isn't panicking. I mean, I guess you had the old guy, you know, the Barclays of the world going, oh man, this game's unwatchable. But the sport itself is not saddled with the same attitude that baseball is that we have to do something they just sort of treat it like well this is the game that we have today well i think they're I, oh go ahead go ahead i was just gonna add that like yeah i think when you say from like a a non-analytical mind or 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 childhood growing up like we're we're trying to get the best shot we can get as a team that doesn't mean and that doesn't compute in my mind the highest points per possession shot we can get it. So there's a difference there between passing and cutting. And now I sound really old and ending up (laughs) with the best basketball shot this team could get. I don't know that that is not necessarily the way the NBA game is played. No, I see it as the basketball, the biggest change in my lifetime watching basketball is that when I was growing up in the 80s as a kid watching the game that basketball was expected to be a game of makes. You're supposed to make shots. If you're a good shooter, you make half your shots. It's just that simple. You were supposed to make 50% of your shots. No matter what position you played, if you were a center, you know, I mean, Will Chamberlain shot 72% from the field one year, right? I mean, so you're supposed to make your shots. And if you're a good offensive player, you're supposed to make 80% of your free throws. Today, that's not really the case. I mean, Dennis Johnson and Isaiah Thomas weren't considered great shooters because they were only making 45%. Guys would kill to make 45% today. And that's because now if you're shooting 39, 40% from three, that's actually really good. So it's a game of misses now with higher, with higher upside because you're getting the three-point shot. 
It's a total, it's, it is the difference in terms of watching the game for me. See, I, some of this stuff, oh man, I wish I, I wish I were better prepared. That's what I say. I, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing right here. I'm, I'm looking up what the average field goal percentage in the NBA is because I, I've done this before with free throw shooting where people said, oh, you know, free throw shooting is so, so bad that the lost art of the free throw. And then when I did the math or the research, it turns out, no, it, it's been pretty stable throughout the history of the NBA. What? Well, the, this what, is generally true of three of, of, of field goal percentages. However, they, you, what you, what you see in the NBA historically, cause I, I actually did this. I prepared for you. <laughs> um, what, what you did see is you have to do it through error. Like one of the reasons why people talk about the greatest era of base of offense in baseball before the steroid era was in the 1800s. But the mm -hmm. reason why there was such a huge influx of offense was because of the number of unearned runs. Guys couldn't catch the ball. They were making a lot of errors. Right. So you had higher runs per game back in the late 1800s, early 1900s than you did in the 20s and the 30s because guys were catching the ball. The equipment got better. There were more catches, which is not right. that different from shifting. It, things change the sport. Basketball, you go back and look at Bob Cousy shoot. I mean, the guys were shooting in the 30s. Yeah, yeah. Right? They were shooting in the 30s and the 40s. Even even a guy like Bob Pettit, who is one of the all-time great offensive machines, a 40% shooter. Yeah. And, you know, Bill Russell's a 40% shooter. And so then as you start to get into the six, the late 60s and early 70s, the shooting percentages started to go up. And that's why you don't have guys like Wilt Chamberlain averaging 32 rebounds a game anymore. Right. Because guys are actually making shots. And then it began to dip again in the 90s because of the hand checking and the just the physical nature of the sport. And then it began to rise up again. So it really is, if you look at the history of field goal percentages, it's not really the three point shot necessarily. It is the cyclical nature of makes and misses. And a lot of that has to do with style of play. Uh, the reason also, another reason why there were so many rebounds in the fifties and sixties was because teams were playing like 140 possessions per game. It was insane. They were just running up and down the court. And, and so a lot of those numbers are inflated as a result because the pace was so fast compared to when we hit basically rock bottom of uh, 1994, 95, where it's like mm -hmm. everything is a slog. Everything is, is slowed down to a crawl. Final 68, pace of 63. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, which, by the way, we haven't gone far, far enough back to a time when the final score was 19 to 18. And they said, guys, what do we got to do here? How about an artificial clock to tell us to hurry up and shoot this? Think that's about right. that. We so what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's as radical as radical gets, right? We're going to put an artificial clock. But, you know, if we say the same thing now, it seems like a crazy idea. But we accept it in basketball. Not only do we accept it in basketball as this is how it's played, we don't even count, like, those records anymore from the pre-shot clock era. What's the fewest points in a, in a quarter? What's the fewest points in a game? No one wants to know about that 1918 game where two teams basically held the ball for the entire game because we realize that isn't basketball. At some point, it is a predecessor. It is it is it's the primordial ooze from which the sport we see now uh, came out of the, the, the water with. But if we, but if basketball, to stick on basketball here, because I think part of the opening question here on this basketball side, I was like, do we widen the court so that a three at least is the same distance all the way around or make the whole three pointer farther away? So disincentivized to continue mm -hmm. to shoot as, as many, because if what we're all getting at here is the cyclical nature of sports, where if one thing is emphasized, then we get better at the other thing. So, you know, yep. it's like the counter programming right now, the way basketball is, if nothing changes, you're never going to be disincentivized to do exactly what we're doing because it's a complete analytical number game. Like you need to change something outside of that to get the cyclical effect that we're talking about. So, so here's, let me ask this question then. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I mean, go ahead. Okay, so here, here's the funny thing about moving the three-point line back. What if we made the three-point line 24 feet, right? 25 feet. What ends up happening is you start to thin the herd on the number of people who can actually make that shot. Which is happening now already. So if you bad even, teams acting like Steph Curry is unwatchable. So if you but if you do that, what ends up happening is by and large, more and more defenses are gonna say they kicked it out beyond the three point line. I don't need to guard that guy. 
So what happens then? They start to sag. Now you got a sagging defense, regardless of where the shooters are on the perimeter. What does that mean for the star player who I off, I offer to you? That's what we came to watch. I didn't come to I didn't come to watch Jordan Poole. I came to watch Steph Curry. Now because Steph Curry is so great and demands so much attention, Jordan Poole might get off, or you know, or Kevon Looney might get off, or whatever. But Make no mistake, I don't want to watch a game where the defense is so good, it neutralizes the guy I actually came to see. I came to see Embiid, I came to see Jokic, I came to see uh, LeBron, I came to see John Morant. And if I make it so the defense says, I don't have to do a Sophie's choice of, do I help on this awesome offensive talent here, or do I stay home on my deadly shooter who I'm guarding? If it's so far where he's not that deadly, I'm not doing Sophie's choice anymore. I'm like, yeah, I'm sagging. Go ahead, shoot it. I don't care. And if you do that, it steals the joy that we actually showed up for, which was to see the stars be stars. And that, I mean, is the reason why baseball said no more shifts. That's right. We are here to watch David Ortiz blast Mm -hmm. a ball through this infield or hit the ball out of the ballpark. We're not here to have him hit a one hopper to a second baseman who is 125 feet away from his position. Mm. Right. I mean, yep. that is the reason why they did this, because they, you know, you could see or there was a feeling that the joy was being stolen out of here, here to watch these guys play. We're not here to watch these guys ground out on balls that would have been hits and that rallies that should have been. Yeah. I mean, do we have an appetite to take this like even broader to just how algorithms and metrics impact our own behavior outside of the sports world? Because I mean, you see this. I know, Howard, you don't spend a ton of time on like Instagram and stuff, but you you can constantly see what gets rewarded and what performs well. And you start to post based on what performs well, whether it's a real. I mean, these things are happening in real mm-hmm. time across mm-hmm. algorithms like, well, that's why you I know, like the standardized testing thing. It's the same. Yeah. Exactly. And so for for somebody, I mean, I don't care about social, but I'm I'm kind of on it and I'm fascinated by my own leaning toward, oh, a reel does better. And I know these photos do better than that photo. So I'm, I'm stripped of just existing on those platforms and I'm now incentivized to perform in a certain way. Yes. And I'm no longer, I'm no longer just like a human being doing what I think works and what I want to share. I am feeding into the algorithm and the algorithm exists because like on Instagram, you can you can monetize certain things and they're only going to let other people see the reels which are being monetized which they are taking the sliver of so it's like how are we still like how do we maintain like the humanity of the game the humanity of being existing on these platforms when the algorithms are pointing us in different directions it, well, it, ba- if you're baseball the argument was legislation ban the shit yeah. Right. That's that was their answer to this. Uh, we talk about this all the time on 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 Twitter, where it was okay. Why is this tweet? Why does this one have sixty seven thousand likes and this one has four hundred? And how many times? How many people out there are being reckless with their jobs, with their careers, with their personalities and their reputations to try to find that thing that goes viral? Yeah. To try to find that thing that people pay attention to that they notice. It, it's it, it is funny because ideally, or or as it started, the algorithm was just supposed to be able to say, out of all of these seemingly different things, what is it that they all have in common that makes them appealing on a large scale? Algorithm and which one, and which one stands out? Right. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. So that's what the algorithm was created to do. But what's happened is people, now that we have the algorithm, people now operate not as far as I'm going to do what I'm doing and then maybe some of these traits of what I'm doing fits in with what the algorithm has decided this is what people seem to be reacting to. It's become how do I appease this algorithm? The algorithm is no longer our employee telling you, hey, you know, when you did that, it was really cool. People liked that. Oh, thanks. Now it's like, what may I feed you today, oh, algorithm master? Uh, Give me something with kittens and make sure you post it at between 12 and 1 o'clock Eastern. And also make sure you do this every day at this time. Because those are some of the things with algorithm. What time of day it is and your consistency at hitting that window. And what the content is and what hashtags you have. And also how many people who the algorithm has deemed, oh, yeah, these are the people who get, who make the good content. How many of them are interacting with your, con- with your content? 
So now we are all trying to chase what the algorithm is telling us from above. This is what I want. And instead of being an apostle, the algorithm is our Lord and Savior. And yes. that distorts and takes away the humanity of what you're talking about, Kate, which is I wanted to share a video about, you know, me slipping in some dog dew and then my ice cream fell on my head, right? It just, I thought it was a funny video. Instead, it's like, how can I, what if I slipped in dog dew and then yeah. I had the ice cream fall <laughs> on my head? That'll get them going. And so it's no longer the spontaneous, truly uh, in, uh, improvisational piece of, of I don't want to call it art, but piece of contribution. It is yeah. literally just it's paying tribute. And and that's what I, and, and I mean, this is not a large leap to make. Like I kind of see that has happened in basketball to some degree, some version of it. And I think there's like a, there's a cynicism. Like yeah, I'm thinking even about like one of Metal Larkers, I don't know, I'm gonna make up a number seven where mm -hmm. we talked about King Richard, the movie. Mm -hmm. And there, there was, uh, you know, Richard Williams clearly identified if I raise these girls to be great at tennis, there is a gap to be exploited in that market. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are the stories like that. Sometimes like there's on one hand where I'm like super smart. That was, that made perfect sense. I feel half that. And then there's half of me that feels like, wait, no, but like, aren't we all supposed to pursue things we love as we love them right. and find passions and like create whatever these symphonies of human interaction are. And like, when it's not that, I, I feel myself like being like, we got to fix it. I, I've told this story before. I watched this documentary a few years ago called In Search of Greatness, right? And they, they sat down with some of the greatest of the greats to do different sports. They sat down with Pele, with Wayne Gretzky, with Jerry Rice, a couple other athletes. And they asked them questions about like, basically like, what was your upbringing like? Because we're trying to figure out how is it they arrive at a place where they are literally the greatest to ever do this, whatever it is. And one of the things they found was that multi-sports, playing multiple sports growing up was a big part, in, a shared thing among all of them, which is contrary to what we have now, which is parents finding out their child is good at, you know, baseball and or basketball and then putting them in that at six years old. And that's all they do. And they have that's trainers. Tiger Woods monetizing. Right. Right, exactly. That, the, the tiger that was the Earl Woods on Mike Douglas thing. I built him to be a golfer. Right, right. And so Gretzky, when he was talking about this, he said, "Yeah, when I was like twelve, I wanted to be a major league baseball player." He said, "As soon as hockey season was over, I threw all my hockey gear in the basement. I grabbed my mitt, and then for the rest of summer, I never touched my hockey stuff." This is the unequivocal greatest player to ever play the sport, and he's telling you. It wasn't until like he was like 14 or 15 where I was like, yeah, I'm kind of good at this hockey thing. Well, I guess I better like start to focus in on it, which is, com again, compare and contrast that with the millions of amateur athletes every year who who's, their families or whatever just basically said, forget about doing anything else. This is your thing, which in a very ironic way, that's how China does sports, by the way. Well, and that's how you burn these kids out. And that's what Absolutely. Yeah. So much we're talking about mental health and everything else. Yeah. So... Me, and maybe, sorry, go ahead, Howard. No, no, go ahead, Kate. Um, I was trying to make a connection there between like, I think what you're, what, the heart of what you're saying, I mean, is that no matter what incentives exist, whether we found out in basketball, this is how you maximize X, Y, Z, same with baseball. If you go back to the story of the people who became the greatest at things, it's usually not born of yeah. a very cynical, zeroed in, I have to, like, there, there is no like, nine-year-old right now who can be like well i know in the nba they're maximizing the corner three therefore i will only shoot corner like that person is probably never going to be the greatest of all time so there's an element of trust that we have to have that these, there's an adult these out things there really... thinking it though <laughs> that's true yeah. it's it, it's paint by numbers in something that was never paint by numbers right not only the greatest to do it but kate most often the people who inspired you to want to do this in the first place they're telling you we didn't do it like that we didn't like yeah. we didn't set out to do this. We just went out there and did it. And 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 I don't know, like this is the part I don't is this the burden of humanity in this age of information yeah. where everything is quantifiable and large amounts of data, which 
up until this point in human history, we were never able to process this much information all at once. Now we can do it all in the blink of an eye. Is this really, in a weird way, human evolution? This isn't just a blip on the radar. We're changing fundamentally how we approach everything, and it's kind of making us for the worse as opposed to the better. Yeah, no doubt. And for me, I still have to say, I understand it, and this has been a phenomenal conversation in that because... At the end of the day, I do think that that you're both right. We are here to watch these guys and these women play the sport to their highest. I am completely against shifts because I didn't understand the need to legislate it. But at the end of the day, if the goal is so you can watch your favorite players or you can watch the best players do what they do at a high level, mm -hmm. I guess I have to relent. I get it. I get why they did it. <laughs> and, that, and with that, we will see you all. Next week, we don't even have a topic for next week, but we'll think about it. On we'll the figure it out as we go along. That's right. right. We got this. Kate Fagan, <laughs> Amin El Hassan, thank you.